This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Eric Donowski of Erie, Pennsylvania was born with a serious liver disease. After two unsuccessful transplants, doctors doubted the boy would live to see his first birthday. Then Eric's plight was publicized, and area churches were swamped by hundreds of worshipers praying for his recovery. Today, Eric Donowski is a happy, healthy seven-year-old, a living testament, some would say, to the mysterious power of prayer. When he was arrested at the tender age of 21, Lionel Luviano was considered one of the most powerful drug lords in Texas. But while awaiting trial, Luviano was transported to a private hospital for medical treatment. Even though he was under guard, Luviano soon engineered a bold escape, cleverly disguised as his own sister. In South Dakota, a night of party culminated in terror for three young friends. However, this was no routine case of drinking and driving. By the time help arrived, two of the car's occupants had inexplicably vanished. Police scoured the area for days, yet found no trace of the missing couple. Incredibly, three months later, their bodies were discovered floating in a ditch just 75 feet from the crash site. Police now fear they were victims of foul play, but how and why remains a troubling mystery. Join me tonight for this intriguing new case and much more on another fascinating edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Over a century ago, the poet Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. But these days, at least when things are going well, it seems that many of us are almost too busy for prayer. It can be quite different, however, when a life hangs in the balance. You're about to meet two people, a woman and a little boy, who believe their lives were changed by prayer. Friday, December 1st, 1991, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. During a follow-up exam, 42-year-old Kathleen Berghardt is stunned when a sonogram confirms a large lump in her right breast. Kathleen's doctors feared the worst, cancer. She was directed to come back on Monday for a biopsy and possible mastectomy. I just went into an absolute panic. I had known two women that were younger than I that are dead from breast cancer. So I had this anxiety and this panic about not having breast surgery or even a biopsy. I didn't even want a biopsy. Kathleen had read about the power of prayer and meditation and done a little bit of both. But over that weekend, she intensified her efforts I went home and I literally uh, told everybody to leave me alone, that I was going to concentrate my whole weekend on healing, and that I wasn't going to have that surgery on Monday. I put into practice everything that I had been reading about fasting and um, went on a fruit juice and fruit fast and didn't eat any meat or any other kind of meals, and listened to the tapes and did a lot of praying, got down on my knees. and just really ask God to heal me. Take this away from me, please. I didn't hear audible voices, but I just 
heard a still small voice in my head, just like you read about in the books. I felt the peace that passes all understanding. I felt very peaceful, very calm, very serene. The fear went away, the anxiety went away. I became very convinced that I was healed and that this was totally gone. All right, let's see what we got. On Monday, Kathleen was x-rayed again, just prior to her biopsy. I don't see any lumps. There are no lumps in the breast today. Are, are you sure these are her pictures? Yes. You didn't take any other patient's pictures? No. Did you go get the doctor? Yes. Have a seat. We're going to talk to the doctor. Doctor, this is what I wanted to show you. The pictures that we took today and the pictures from Friday. What happened here? There are no lumps in her breast. Oh. How's that? Possible? Kathleen's doctor was dumbfounded. He was cautious and wanted to conduct the biopsy anyway. But Kathleen was adamant. She was going home. Well, I was leaving the hospital. I was getting dressed, and I was telling all the nurses and everybody, I'm out of here. I'm gone. I'm healed. I said, this is an early Christmas present from God. For many years, doctors have called these phenomena spontaneous remissions and explained it away, oh, that's just a spontaneous remission. But what is that? This is a healing. And we have to, as healers, find out how this happens. What are the mechanisms so that more people can have this experience? Kathleen has been healthy for more than three years. She continues to meditate and pray and to go in for regular breast exams. But was she actually helped by the power of prayer? Some are skeptical. There's no question that the mind exerts an influence over what happens in the body. The issue at hand is whether prayer or any other kind of mental exercise can predictably influence what happens to a person. And with respect to prayer, there simply is no evidence that it does. Dr. Larry Dossey, former chief of staff at Medical City Hospital in Dallas, Texas, takes issue with Dr. Barrett. One of the best kept secrets in modern medicine is the scientific data surrounding prayer. Currently, there are over 130 studies showing that if you bring prayer into the laboratory, the hospital, or the clinic, and you do what we call a controlled, double-blind study, uh, the prayer works. The most significant study in the century, I think, uh, was done by Dr. Randolph Byrd at the University of California Medical School in San Francisco. It took place uh, in the coronary care unit. Almost 400 people were involved. They either had a heart attack or severe chest pain. Everybody gets treated with state-of-the-art coronary care techniques. The difference was that half the people get prayed for. This was a double-blind study. Nobody knew who was and wasn't being prayed for. The results showed that the prayed for patients did significantly better. They needed fewer drugs, there were fewer deaths in the prayed for group, and nobody in the prayed for group wound up on the mechanical ventilator. Twelve of the people not being prayed for had to have this done. Many in the medical community find Dr. Bird's study unconvincing, and even his proponents admit that when it comes to prayer, you cannot adequately monitor a human control group. But sometimes, as in our next story, the life of a child can make scientific studies seem completely irrelevant. On March 2, 1988, at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, world-renowned organ transplant specialist, Dr. Thomas Starzl, worried over one of his patients, an 11-month-old baby boy, Eric Donowski, who had just undergone a liver transplant. By the time he had his first transplant in February of 1988, he was already quite ill. His uh, outlook became progressively wor worse because the first liver uh, was rejected, uh, necessitating a second one, which was done about eight or nine days later. 
The second one, you know, I was like, how much more can his little body take? You know, he was so frail. So his, he had bones sticking out of his back. He was so skinny and had been bedridden for so long that we weren't, you know, you, you had your doubts, you know. I mean, I kept my faith, kept positive attitude, but in the back of your mind, there's always that doubt. Is he really going to be able to pull through all this, you know? Three weeks after Eric's second transplant, his parents were put on alert again. Dr. Starzl was not optimistic. Dr. Starzl, how's Eric? I'm afraid not good. Eric has developed viral pneumonia, and I, I give him about a 50-50 chance. 50-50? Well, what, what can you do for him? There's really nothing more we can do. I think you should prepare yourself for the worst during the next 48 hours. 48? I'm sorry. And down inside, I guess I wouldn't accept that, you know. But hearing it from such a powerful doctor who has been through so much and has seen so much, that it was a very scary thought coming, you know, a statement coming from him. I didn't want to hear that my son wasn't going to live. There's nothing more the doctors could do, and there was nothing we could do. And the only thing that we had left was to hope that the Lord would answer our prayers. He said that the next 48 hours are very crucial. That same night, Debbie spoke with Jack Grazier, a newspaper reporter who had written several articles about Eric's medical odyssey. Jack told Debbie he would write another piece, asking his readers to pray for the boy. The article appeared in the Erie, Pennsylvania Daily Times a few days later. Immediately, churches all over central Pennsylvania were inundated with worshipers praying for little Eric Donowski. I felt that heaven was bombarded that night with prayers. And I really, really felt strongly in the power of prayer. You know, we both went down to the chapel and we were like, God, whatever you have in store for us, just give us the, the strength to deal with it, whether you, you, know, you want Eric or whether you're going to keep him with us. You know, we, you know, we want him with us, but, you know, just give us some strength and we'll deal with what we have to deal with. Within a few days, it seemed that a miracle was taking place. Eric experienced a sudden and unexpected turnaround. Less than a week later, it was Eric's first birthday. His family and medical team gathered to celebrate. Hi, Dr. Starzl. <laughs> well, I've got some pretty good news for you folks on this birthday. Why? Looks like Eric has beaten the virus. Doctor? Mm -hmm. That's great. That's I feel in my heart that Eric's recovery was definitely a miracle. He was just such a very sick little boy. I've had some of the best doctors in the world state that medically there was nothing more that they could do for him. It was the first day that I think I felt like a really sense of relief that he was going to make it. Did prayer give um, Eric a booster? Uh, I don't know. When I, when I was young, I would probably have scoffed at the idea. But I've seen things and uncovered things over the last um, nearly 40 years that uh, uh, make me unwilling to be nihilistic about any possibility. And I think that includes uh, uh, prayer. Eventually, Eric underwent a third liver transplant, this one a resounding success. Today, Eric is eight years old and going strong, more than able to keep up with his big brother. Thankfully, Eric was far too young to remember his ordeal. His parents have told him about it, though, and he thinks he understands. When I found out how sick I was, um, I realized that um, I was very sick and a lot of people were praying for me. I want to make one thing perfectly clear. If you've got appendicitis, you ought to have an appendectomy. 
We're not advising people to give up drugs and surgical procedures and just wing it with prayer. Uh, on the other hand, you should feel free while you're doing that, while you're having surgery for your appendicitis, to get prayed for too, because there are studies which show literally that prayer increases the healing rate of surgical wounds. So we ought to do what works. I think this just falls in the category of common sense. Did prayer help Kathleen Burghardt and Eric Donowski? Each of us must decide for ourselves. While prayer can never take the place of medicine, it seems to offer a powerful assist. Next, authorities need your help to capture a fugitive drug lord who escaped from custody dressed as a woman. August 4, 1994, 21-year-old Lionel Luviano was arrested in Houston, Texas, the culmination of a six-month sting operation. Despite his youth, Luviano was a key figure in an international drug ring that reportedly moved nearly a quarter of a million dollars in heroin every month. Since the tender age of 17, Luviano had enjoyed a playboy's lavish lifestyle cars, motorcycles, expensive clothes, and plenty of girlfriends. The one thing he had never planned on was serious jail time. But with his arrest for heroin trafficking, Luviano faced the very real possibility of spending the best years of his life behind bars. Lionel Luviano, however, had no intention of trusting his fate to the legal system. Shortly before his arrest, he had wrecked his motorcycle and sustained serious injuries. While Luviano awaited trial, authorities had no choice but to let him continue his medical treatments outside of jail in a private facility. Luviano was transferred to a guarded room in Houston's LBJ Hospital, where he would be shackled to his bed 24 hours a day. Luviano shared room 3B3 with a total stranger named Vasquez Martinez, the recent victim of an armed robbery. A week passed uneventfully. Then on October 4th, visitors arrived unannounced. Three individuals, two women and a man, walked into LBJ Hospital, did not have to go through any security measures as this is not an institution walked up to the third floor, Lionel Luviano's room. We're here to see our friend Vasquez Martinez, please. Yes. They indicated they were going to visit the individual across the bed from Lionel Luviano. Well, the guard was in a position to see them walk over to the other individual's bed. So he felt comfortable in the fact, as would anybody, that they were just visiting the individual across the bed, who was not a prisoner, and he was able to have visitors at any time of the day. On that day, behind the door of room 3B3, an incredible escape began to unfold. Hey, Vasquez, we got some business to take care of. In reality, the three visitors were one of Luviano's sisters and two other family members. Never mind. Vasquez Martinez would soon realize what the three strangers had in mind. Believing they were armed, Martinez could only look on in stunned disbelief. Meanwhile, Lionel was in the midst of a total makeover, a shave, a simple full-cut two-piece crepe suit, then a wig, a dash of makeup, and the transformation was complete. Lionel Luviano was about to make his escape, masquerading as his own sister. The guard outside of the hospital room was not surprised when he saw two women and a man leave the room. That's what he'd observed walk into the room. Luviano's sister stayed behind. With a concealed gun, she kept the bewildered Vasquez Martinez from sounding the alarm. She would later slip away during the commotion following the discovery of Luviano's escape. The clever charade had gone exactly as planned. Eventually, Luviano's accomplices would be captured. But to this day, 
the cross-dressing drug lord remains on the lam. Lionel Luviano was looking at approximately 20 years in uh, prison. Being that it be in a uh, uh, federal prison, he would approximately do 19 of those years. There's very little good time given and such like this. So I'm sure that this played quite heavily on his mind, his desire to escape. Lionel Luviano led a very extravagant lifestyle when he was free in the Houston area. There's no doubt in my mind that he's attempting to still live that type of a lifestyle. He's 21 years old and had all the luxuries of, of an extremely extravagant individual. Lake Andy, South Dakota, December 12, 1992, at 6 in the morning, a car stopped at a remote intersection at the edge of the Yankton Sioux Indian Reservation. It was cold. The road was icy. All three of the car's occupants had been drinking. The car jumped the highway and came to rest in a frozen over ditch. The driver of the car was 20-year-old Arnold Archambo. One of the passengers was his girlfriend, Ruby Bruyere, age 19. The other passenger was Ruby's cousin, 17-year-old Tracy Dion. Hello? Is anybody down there? By the time help arrived, Tracy was the only person still in the car. Okay? For some unexplained reason, a reason Tracy still cannot understand, Arnold and Ruby had apparently just walked away and abandoned her. I was really scared because, gee, Ruby's my cousin, you know. How can she leave me, you know? If she got out, how come, how come you know, she didn't want to help me out, you know? Or why didn't Arnold try to help me get out too, you know? Why did Arnold and Ruby leave their best friend trapped in an overturned car in the bitter cold? For three months, there were no signs whatsoever of the young couple. They had quite literally vanished into thin air. Then came the morning of March 10, 1993, and a tragic discovery. The body of Ruby Bruyere was found floating in the ditch. The next day, Arnold's body turned up just a few yards away. What could have happened to Arnold Archambault and Ruby Bruyere? The area surrounding a ditch had been repeatedly searched in the weeks after the accident, yet the bodies were found just 75 feet from the crash site. In this incredible and bizarre case, every answer seems to give rise to another disturbing question. And one question in particular haunts every aspect of the investigation. Were Arnold Archambeau and Ruby Bruyere the victims of foul play? <laughs> Arnold and Ruby were both Yankton Sioux. They grew up together on the reservation, began dating in high school, and soon fell in love. Yeah. Arnold was a very nice young man. He's never been in any serious trouble of any kind. But I pushed him and pushed him, and I got him graduated. And he was crowned king in his senior year, you know, and he was at the prom and all this. And he was really popular. Ruby was a real gentle person. She's always laughing, you know. She jokes around. She never said any harsh words to us. And if she'd done anything wrong, she always told us that she did do something wrong. In 1991, Arnold and Ruby became parents when their daughter Erica was born. From the start, it was a struggle. Arnold and Ruby were still kids themselves and hardly ready to settle down. On Saturday, December 11th, 1992, Ruby, Arnold, and Tracy embarked on an all-night party spree. At around 6 the next morning, they ended up back at Tracy's house where they had left the baby. Tracy's father was waiting for them. 
Hey, Charlie. Arnold. Just came to get Erica. Hi, kids. Hi. Well, you kids been drinking pretty hard tonight, huh? Just a little. Why don't you guys leave her here and come back later this afternoon and pick her up then? All right. Tracy? Um, I think I'm gonna go with these guys for a while longer, Dad. Okay. All you right, guys drive careful now, okay? Bye. See ya. We left from there, and then that's when we came up to that stop sign. That's all I remember is just him, you know, us looking and, you know, saying there ain't no cars and him spinning out from the stop sign. And it was just like a snap of a finger. And next thing I know, we end up in the ditch. upside down in the ditch and just Ruby and I was in the car you know Arnold wasn't in the car and I don't know where he was Ruby was crying she was saying oh my god oh my god she just kept hitting the car the next thing I know the door you know it was open a little ways and she had enough room where she slid out and then so I was gonna reach over and then it was just like that the door went shut I know if that was me and I had gotten out, I wouldn't have left without trying to get Ruby out, you know. Why she left, I don't know. Why Arnold left, I don't know. If, if they left together, I don't know. I don't know why. By daybreak, the police were already searching the area. Even though the spot where the car had come to rest was frozen solid, the authorities feared that Arnold and Ruby had wandered off and fallen through the ice at some other location. We walked around the ice part. We had one officer walk on the opposite side of the railroad tracks, thinking maybe they wandered off toward the lake area, which was also frozen. I've been to a number of accidents where there hasn't been somebody around, the driver hasn't been there, no passengers there. And a lot of times it's because they've been partying out drinking, I mean, we do have a DWI law. That was initially my first thought. Maybe Arnold was out drinking and uh, didn't want to get arrested, so we figured he'd show up in a few days. I know he wouldn't hide. You know, he would have came home to us or called us and told us, I'm over here, don't worry about me. But we never heard anything from him. And I thought, well, gee, she, you know, she, it's not like her to um, leave her baby this long, so maybe there is something wrong somewhere, or maybe she's hurt, or she can't get to us, you know. The police never found any evidence that Arnold and Ruby had fallen through the ice. Over the next three months, Deputy Youngstrom turned the search into a personal crusade. He worked tirelessly, investigating every possible lead. Day after day, he came up empty, until the spring thaw. In early March, a passing motorist saw a body in the ditch just 75 feet from the accident site. It was Ruby Bruyere. I was very shocked the morning that I received the radio transmission that they'd found a body. Uh, of course, it wasn't broadcasted any names across, but I knew immediately who they had found. Uh, it was either going to be Ruby Bruyere or Arnold Archambault. Her glasses were missing, both shoes were missing. Uh, her clothes were intact. It appeared to be the same clothes that she had on the night of the accident. But the body was very decomposed. It was hard to recognize. Uh, in fact, we had to get down to uh, look at a tattoo to get a positive identification of the body. At that time, our department decided that we would start pumping the ditch out. And about noon the next day, we found the body of Arnold submerged in the water about 15 feet away from where we found Ruby. Arnold's body was very well kept. His skin color was fine. He was not frozen to the ground. The clothes were not frozen to the ground. There is a question mark as far as in our investigation if he, he was wearing the same clothes that he was the night of the accident. 
Deputy Youngstrom was completely baffled. How could two bodies found in the same location be in such different states of decomposition? And how could they end up in an area that had already been so thoroughly searched? The bodies were immediately autopsied, but the results only served to deepen the mystery. There was no way of determining the time of death, and there seemed to be no evidence of foul play. The coroner concluded that Arnold and Ruby had both died of exposure. Death by exposure is kind of a, to me, a, uh, it's just like they froze to death. And uh, I cannot actually buy that. They may have froze to death, but they didn't freeze to death at that ditch. It's impossible that they could have been there the entire three months. I myself personally walked that ditch several times during that period. I've gotten written affidavits from people that's also watched, walked it, people that had nothing to do with the case. Uh, they couldn't have been there. They couldn't have been missed. Police were further baffled by the discovery of two items that seemed to support the theory that Arnold and Ruby had not died in the ditch on December 12th. Well, you want to come over here? I got something here. We found a tuft of hair alongside the road. This hair was later determined by the forensic laboratory to belong to Ruby Brewer. That hair couldn't have stayed there for three months. In my opinion, it was when whoever brought the bodies back to the ditch that's when that piece of hair fell off a of ruby prior to being placed back in the ditch area. At the time we pulled Arnold's body from the ditch, I found a set of keys in his pocket. The keys were a car or vehicle key and what appeared to be two house keys. I still have these keys in my possession, and to this day I have not found the vehicle nor the house that these keys fit. Hi, Arnold. What are you doing? Nothing. Just driving around. Soon, another startling revelation. A witness claimed to have seen Arnold, accompanied by three other people on New Year's Eve, almost three weeks after he was reported missing. All right, we probably will. OK, then. All right, later. Later. In my mind, it is a very credible sighting. She talked to Arnold, knows Arnold personally, and uh, was no doubt in her mind that it was Arnold that she was talking to. Do you think you were mistaken when you seen Arnold on New Year's Eve? No. Authorities brought the witness in for a polygraph exam. She passed. Regarding Later, Arnold, the couple she identified as being in the back seat of the car also underwent a polygraph. They denied being there, but they did fail the polygraph. We questioned those two people thoroughly afterwards, and they held to their story that they were not there that night. They never seen Arnold during or Ruby during those three months and uh, said that they were at home that evening. How did the bodies of Arnold Archambo and Ruby Bruyer end up in the very ditch where they crashed their car three months earlier? A bizarre coincidence? An oversight by the police? Or perhaps something far more insidious? They didn't die there. They had to die someplace else. They had somebody had to come and put them back in there again to make it look like that, that's where they died. I believe that someone done that, yeah, someone killed Arnold. I really do believe that. But how, I don't know. Ruby and Arnold had a daughter. She's going to grow up without a mother and father. They were taken from her. We have this play. When she asked me the question, what happened to my mom and dad, I don't want to say, I don't know. I want to be able to tell her what happened. My mom. Time has not dimmed the image. Al Henderson and Gene Moore during happier days, before Gene's unexplained disappearance, before Al fell under a cloud of suspicion. During a courtship that spanned some 20 years, Al built a multi-million dollar real estate empire. Gene rose through the corporate ranks to become a regional bank escrow officer. In December of 1991, Al proposed marriage and Gene accepted. She was very happy and we were making plans for the wedding. 
she was just real, real happy. Once she had decided that it would be okay to marry me, then she got more excited about it with each passing day. However, Jean's engagement did little to alter her children's opinions of Al Henderson. The longer I knew him, the less genuine he seemed. I know he said that he loved her many times, but he also had a habit of putting her down in front of other people. And to me, that just didn't sound like love. When your mother asks you to be nice to somebody who they like, you go along with it, even though you've tried to talk, like I did, I tried to talk my mom out of being around the guy. Jean Moore followed her heart. A few months after the proposal, she and Al set out from their home in Apple Valley, California, to vacation in Laughlin, Nevada, a scaled-down version of Las Vegas. It was there on April 9, 1992, that Al reported Jean missing. No one has seen or heard from her since. Today, most of those acquainted with this case are convinced that Jean Moore met with foul play. Since Jean vanished, her children's simmering disapproval of Al Henderson has turned to outright suspicion, pitting them against the man their mother planned to marry. What follows is Al Henderson's account of Jean's last day. It was Thursday, April 9th, 1992. According to Al, Jean wanted a final chance at her lucky slot machine before checking out of their hotel. Al told us that he dropped her off at a side entrance of a nearby casino and went to find a parking place. When I did not find one, then I returned to the valet parking. Can my wife pick up the car later? Thank you. Got the ticket went inside the casino where Jean was waiting for me. Here's a claim check for the car. Our plan was that we would meet back at our hotel room at a quarter of 12. Al claims he left Jean in the casino at around 9.30 a.m. Once outside, he planned to flag down a taxi and return to their hotel. There was no cab there. So after waiting a couple of minutes and a cab didn't come, I thought, well, it would be nice I could go play the slots with her a little bit. But Al found Jean's favorite slot machine already in use. I felt well because someone was there playing it. She may have decided to go shopping or some other thing. From a quarter of 10 to 10.15, I played the machine that she liked, hoping that she would come back and I would be able to get up and just say, here's your machine, have fun. Twelve fifteen p.m. Can you take these bags to security? We're checking out. Still believing that nothing was wrong, Al returned to the hotel and checked out. He then took a cab back to the casino to find Jean. When I saw that the car was right where it had been left, and I spoke to the valet, nobody had brought a ticket for the car, then I began to become alarmed. Al says he thoroughly searched the lobby, the shops, and the gaming area. Gene Moore was nowhere to be found. Over the next few days, Al questioned dozens of people and distributed thousands of these flyers in the Laughlin area. Despite the offer of a $25,000 reward, not one helpful call was received. After a certain amount of time, I had to figure that uh, something terrible has happened. Gene's children reached the same conclusion but they are convinced that Al Henderson knows more about Gene's fate than he has admitted. The more we find out about what supposedly happened as compared to what can be verified, the less I'm inclined to believe that he's telling the full truth. In my opinion, Al has not said everything that had happened then. The reason I say that is because, number one, the story has changed a couple of times. 
In his original statement to police, Al Henderson insisted repeatedly that he drop Jean off in front of the casino and gave her the valet ticket there. But Al told us that he left Jean at a side entrance and gave her the ticket inside the casino. I'll meet you back at the hotel about quarter to 12. Did she leave anything in the room? Other details made Jean's children uneasy. For starters, Jean had left most of her jewelry in the hotel room. And her engagement ring. It seemed very odd to me that she had left her engagement ring that she was so proud of. I thought it was very strange. She was not one to go out without her purse or without her jewelry. It, within a couple of days, or within the day, you know, I, I knew that he was involved. Or I, in my heart, I know he was involved. When I got off the plane, when I flew into Bullhead, which is across the river, I had the first place I went to was the police station. And I asked them if there was anything on my mother, and I let them know my feelings on what had happened. Al had given police precise details about his last morning with Gene. Authorities turned up an impartial witness that could validate his account. A network of surveillance cameras monitoring virtually every square inch of the casino 24 hours a day. Al Henderson says he pulled into the valet area at around 9.15 a.m. Surveillance tapes confirm the arrival of Al's Cadillac that morning. Cameras in the lobby also recorded Al's entry into the casino. Beyond this point, Al and the surveillance footage seem to disagree. This tape shows two views of the area where Al said he gave the valet ticket to Jean. Additional cameras should have picked up glimpses of Jean as she moved about the casino. I have reviewed four of those tapes of the areas that uh, Mr. Henderson said that they were in. And the tapes that uh, I have reviewed, the surveillance tapes that I have reviewed, we do not see Jeannie in any of those tapes. I can't really comment on that. I can only tell you what happened. I, I accept no responsibility for what their tapes show or don't show because I am not an expert in that field. I can just tell you what happened. Al's assertion that he played Gene's lucky slot machine should also have been backed up by the cameras. In uh, examining the uh, tapes for the time frame, Al gave us 9.45 to approximately 10.15. The machines that he told security was her favorite machine. We do not see Al playing those machines. Well, the only response to that is that he was evidently looking at the tape of the wrong machine. I have checked with the surveillance personnel for the hotel, and they have advised me that this is the group of machines that Al Henderson told the security personnel was Jeannie's favorite machine and asked if they would make a copy of them for him. Uh, he was instructed they could not do that, that they would turn them over to the police. So these are the surveillance tapes for the machines Al told security was her favorite machine. Investigators began to wonder if Jean had been in Laughlin at all. Eventually, they found a waitress who had served Al and Jean on Monday, April 6th, the day they arrived. Have you had any luck in the casino yet? Other than the coffee shop, we have nobody uh, seeing Jeannie in the Laughlin area. How would you like your steak cooked? The question remained, where was Jean Moore between the Monday sighting and the Thursday report that she was missing? A few weeks later, a witness came forward with a possible answer. A friend of Jean's has made the stunning claim that she saw the couple 150 miles away from Laughlin at a gas station in their hometown of Apple Valley. When? April 8th, 4.30 p.m., the day before Jean was reported missing. The witness remembered the uh, time because they were en route to a school function and that would have been uh, only at that time and pinpointed the time and date. I've provided several people with copies of my telephone log from Call USA showing that I made a call from Laughlin to the Victorville area at a little bit after 3 on that day. 
I had another call, I think it was at 6.59 on that day, so you've got less than four hours and it's physically impossible, even if all you did was drive from Laughlin and turn around and go back. You can't do it in less than six hours. Phone records verify that calls were made from Laughlin on Wednesday, as Henderson says. Furthermore, Al's bookkeeper told us that he called her from Laughlin that same Wednesday evening. And uh, so we discussed various things, and then he says, well, just a minute, Jeannie wants to say hi, too. So Jeannie got on the phone, and she was just happier than happy could be, because she had run into a stroke of luck on one of the poker machines. Less than 24 hours later, Jean Moore would be reported missing. Since then, precious little has surfaced to suggest she will ever return. The riddle of Jean Moore's disappearance, reportedly from a busy casino in broad daylight, has defied explanation. Does Al Henderson know more about Jean's faith than he has acknowledged? Or is he something of a victim himself, burdened with false accusations during a time of crushing personal loss? Unequivocally, I had nothing to do with the disappearance of Gene Moore. I had offered the $25,000 reward. I think that uh, my net worth has gone down from around two and a half million to one million. If I could get her back, I'd give the whole one million. I would do anything to get her back. For generations, the Ouija board has been a source of entertainment and fascination for people of all ages. But is it more than just a game? Next week, we'll bring you the remarkable tale of a restless spirit named Patience Worth. Some believe that patients use the Ouija board as an instrument to communicate from the realm of the dead. Also, we'll bring you the intriguing case of a young army enlisted man who mysteriously vanished in 1993. Did he simply tire of military life and go AWOL? Or was he involved in secret operations that could have led to his death? Join me next time. Perhaps you hold the crucial clue that can help solve a mystery. Thank you.